In this problem, we're going to solve mass and energy balances for a double effect evaporator. However, to make it easier to follow the calculations, we've separated out and have already done the mass and energy balances for the first evaporator. They're available in a separate screencast. And then we report the, the values here that are obtained from those calculations. So here are the results from the Mass and energy balance in the first evaporator give us various values. And then the question is, we want to determine what's the concentration of the sugar solution leaving the second evaporator. And we're going to call that X2, and that's a, a mass fraction. And then what's the steam economy? Which means we're going to have to determine how much is evaporating per time. In the second evaporator, we've already determined, and I'll put that number in later, how much is evaporating per time in the first. So I've listed the values that we know. The unknowns are circled, the purple line, and the values calculated for the first evaporator and the values that are given from those calculations are the green rectangles. And so now what we want to do first is determine this temperature, T2. We know the pressure. We don't know the concentration because that's one of our unknowns. So one approach would be to make a reasonable guess at the concentration and calculate how much the boiling point is raised. Use that value. We can then, of course, go back and after we get our answer, change that and see how much difference it makes. But... It turns out the boiling point elevation is pretty small. So let's look at those numbers. So what I'm going to do is, is guess that X2, the concentration is essentially going to double to a mass fraction of 0 0.16. We can calculate the mole fraction, and we showed how to do that calculation in the first screencast that did the balances for evaporator 1. And so this mass fraction... 0099. It's much smaller because the molecular weight for sucrose is high. So then if I substitute in for water, we're, we're now, let me put a prime here, and this is mole fraction. Reasonable approximation, Routh's law, when it's a low mole fraction, times the saturation pressure. That's going to be the pressure in evaporator 2. And so 1 minus 0 0.0099, so everything that's not sucrose is water. Saturation pressure is what we're going to determine. So the saturation pressure then is 0 0.1212 bar. And that corresponds to then a saturation temperature, which is going to be T2, 49.62 degrees C. Well, you can see... Pretty small correction over the pressure. Approximation of 0 0.16 is not going to affect significantly our answer. So the rate of heat transfer in the second effect is going to be the temperature difference between temperature in evaporator 1. Let's call that T1 at 99.73. That's the temperature of the liquid that's leaving and going into the evaporator. It's also the temperature of the vapor that's leaving. And that's what's used to heat up the liquid in the evaporator. So we can write down the rate of heat transfer as the heat transfer coefficient, the area, high, the high temperature T1, the low temperature T2. So I can substitute these values in and calculate Q2. Well, I have Q2, then now I can use in the energy balance for the second evaporator. I also need to do a mass balance for the second evaporator. So let's write down the mass balance first. And that's that the liquid that's fed in, that's the flow rate, either leaves as the more concentrated liquid or it leaves as the water vapor. And so this value we know, 3.51 kilograms per second, that's what we calculated in the previous screencast. And I've rearranged it to solve for mass flow rate of liquid. Use that to eliminate in the energy balance so that I can end up solving for mass flow rate of vapor. And then I can go back and get the mass flow rate of liquid. 
So let's look at the energy balance next. So we have energy flowing in. So we have the mass flow rate of the liquid and it has an enthalpy based on its temperature. The other energy that we're adding, so on the left side, energy being added, that's the heat transfer value we just calculated. And then what's leaving is the liquid mass flow rate at the lower temperature has an enthalpy of liquid and the mass flow rate of vapor leaving and enthalpy of the vapor where we're going to look up these values in the steam tables. We know the temperature, we know they're at saturation conditions. So note that I haven't put the units in, but the mass flow rates are in kilograms per second. The values from the steam tables for enthalpies are kilojoules per kilogram. And then the Q value is in kilojoules per second. So each of these terms is in kilojoules per second. Also note that I substitute in here for the mass flow rate of the liquid leaving the second evaporator in terms of mass flow rate of the vapor that we calculated from the mass balance. So just algebra rearranging, mass flow rate of vapor, 2.19 kilograms per second. So up here, since two flow rates add up to 3.51, it means the mass flow rate of the liquid is 1.32 kilograms per second. So, well, now we're able to calculate the steam economy because the steam economy is going to be the mass flow rates of vapor evaporated in the first and the mass flow rate of vapor evaporated in the second evaporator divided by the mass flow rate of steam fed to the system. So steam economy is actually slightly greater than two and this results because we're actually feeding in a feed that's a higher temperature than the first evaporator if we fed it in at lower temperature we certainly would expect the a steam economy for two effects to be less than two. Well, the last thing we need is the mass balance on the sucrose. So sucrose is coming in in the liquid feed stream that's leaving the first evaporator, and it's leaving in the second feed stream. So what I've done is just write the mass total mass flow rate times the mass fraction of sucrose and so we can solve for x2, or probably realistically, value of 0 0.21. So it's higher than we estimated when we estimated 0.16, which means the temperature will be slightly higher. But remember, this is the mass fraction. The mole fraction is still going to be very low. Well, the final thing we can check is we've calculated Q2, 4490 kilojoules per second. Well, we, we want to make sure that we have that much energy, if you like, meaning the mass flow rate that we're interested in is, let me call it the mass flow rate of the condensate. So the mass flow rate leaving here is 2.11 kilograms per second, right? That's the same value that entered the vapor, but we're assuming most of it condensed. We want to make sure that our assumption that temperature is constant, so not all of it's condensing. So let me call this the mass flow rate of the condensate leaving. We like to know how much of it is liquid to check that we're not violating energy balance by if the temperature actually decreased because we condensed everything, then our calculations for heat transfer are no longer correct. So, so this delta H of vaporization of water at the temperature T1. And so the condensate, if I look up this value 2257, this is kilojoules per kilogram. So the mass flow rate of condensate is 1.99 kilograms per second. So since the flow rate coming in of steam from the first effect 2.11. This means that we can indeed assume the temperature is constant. We're condensing most, but not all of that vapor.